Amen. Thank you, Carl. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to MES Baptist Church, where your church home is your church family, and thank you for joining us here. Thank you for joining us online, and thank you to those who will be watching us later. Uh, we have a great service today, uh, lots of things planned. We are going to remember uh, the events of 9-11, and we're going to talk about how we move forward today. But before we get to all that, I've got uh, quite a few announcements, and September and October are super busy uh, in our church. And so let me give you a few announcements. Uh, first announcement, pray and go every Wednesday night. We've been rained out the last two weeks, uh, but we'll be meeting at six o'clock in here. We'll have maps on which neighborhoods to go to. We'll have all the resources. Uh, remember, we're not knocking on doors. We're praying over homes. We're praying over families, leaving them a door hanger. And uh, we're going to the next home after that. Uh, typically, we, you know, we go door to door for about 20 maybe 30 minutes, and then we go out to eat and have some fellowship together. So I hope that you will join us. Pray and go Wednesday nights, 6 p.m. And if you can't join us on Wednesday, we have the resources in the window. You and friends, your Sunday school, your spouse, your kids, you all can go together whenever you would like. And a number of you have gone at different times, and thank you for going. Uh, other announcements, October 24th, we're going to have our church homecoming Sunday morning. We're going to uh, have lunch together that afternoon. We're going to have activities for the whole family. October 24th, it's time for folks to come and be with their church family. That's homecoming, October 24th. Really important day. Mark that in your calendars. If you haven't seen someone in a while, tell them they really need to be here October 24th. We will RSVP uh, for lunch that day. We'll have room for guests and everything. Uh, but because of the season of COVID that we're in, uh, to best prepare for everyone uh, that we don't waste money, we're going to ask you to RSVP. We'll give you more information on that uh, in the coming weeks. But that'll be October 24th. Uh, next week, uh, if you saw the pastor update, there's a business meeting right after the service. Uh, we have three motions that need to be uh, voted on. That's accepting of deacons. Uh, Sunday school teachers, and then we have a motion from the deacons to let finance committee handling the budget process, and um, uh, finance would like you to approve that sooner than later so that they don't have to wait too long, or deacons want you to approve that, uh, um, and so it's about deacons passing the responsibility of budgeting process, which is in our bylaws, uh, to over to finance. Deacons unanimously agreed Finance said, hey, we'll do it. We just want the church to vote on it before we say yes. And, and so those three motions we'll vote on. Uh, if you have any questions about those, uh, feel free to uh, contact us in the office, email us, and uh, we'll answer all those questions before the vote uh, next Sunday. So those three motions. Uh, also, if you're a part of a committee, please send in uh, any minutes that you need to report. And if your committee's not meeting at this time, we get it, we understand. Just tell us that you're not meeting at this time. Uh, that will be really helpful for all of us. All right. It's a really busy month. Uh, deacons uh, are meeting 3.30 today. Uh, new members class last Sunday this month, September 22nd or 26th. It'll be right after the service in two weeks. Next week is a business meeting. Week after that, uh, new members meeting. Uh, other announcements, also next week, college and careers. Uh, Y'all are invited to my place uh, next Sunday afternoon, 5.30. We'll hang out. We'll play some games, have some food together, 5.30. Uh, other announcements, October 31st. Trunk or treat, save that date. Uh, uh, be thinking about how you want to decorate your cars, and we'll be out here in the parking lot so that we can pass out candy and, and, and bless our community and connect with them. That's trunk or treat, October 31st. Um, I think those are all the announcements. September and October are going to be really busy, and uh, I'm excited about it because that means God's doing a lot of things here, a lot of things going on, and we hope that you will be a part of all of that. Um, last announcement, uh, we, we sent out to the deacons, and maybe you've heard, Floyd uh, had to go into the hospital on Friday for some surgery. Floyd is being discharged uh, this morning, so he is doing fine. Uh, he'll probably be at home all this week uh, before he can get back out. So if those are our announcements. Let me open this up in a word of prayer. Let's pray together. Father God, it is so good to be back uh, in this house with my church family. Thank you for the vacation. Thank you for, for what's ahead. Thank you for all these events. Thank you for all that's going on. Uh, thank you for protecting us and watching over us during this time. And we just pray uh, uh, for protection, continued protection as we move uh, forward in this, this crazy world that we live in. And God, as we come together right now, help us uh, to remember 
Help us to focus on your purpose, your mission. Help us to focus on your word. And God, as we gather together, give us sweet fellowship. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us that we can worship you and know you and grow closer to you right now. So God, we give you the service and we pray that we will bless your name because you are worthy to be praised. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, David. Good morning. We are so glad you're here, as Pastor Scott has already mentioned. And now let's all stand and let's sing a little bit together. We're going to sing, Be Strong in the Lord.
We knew when Martin Luther King was assassinated. And now September 11th, if you're 25 years and older, you remember where you were on September 11th, 2001. Some have asked the question, where was God? That might sound like a tough question to answer. Instead of looking at what happened that day, let's look at what didn't happen. American Airlines Flight 77, 289 seats available, but only 64 people on board. American Airlines Flight 11, 251 seats available, but only 92 people were on board. Both of those flights went into the Twin Towers. American Airlines Flight 175, 351 seats were available, but only 65 people on board. That was the flight that went into the Pentagon. American Airlines Flight 93, 289 seats available, but only 45 people were on board. That was the flight that crashed in Pennsylvania. The World Trade Center, both towers, employed over 50,000 people, and though both towers collapsed quickly, over 90% survived. The Pentagon, where over 23,000 people were employed, only lost 189 lives. More than 99% of them survived. So out of a minimum of 75,000 people potential victims that day, 93% survived. The building in New York City should have probably collapsed immediately. Who held them up so tens of thousands could make it out? The Pentagon was hit at its strongest point, but it was nearly empty to those sections due to renovations. Flight 93 was taken over by patriots that gave their lives so that others would live. So where was God? He was right where he was supposed to be, on his throne, and nothing was out of his sight. So there was God bringing life where the enemy had chosen massive destruction and death. Yes, there were some that died that day, and for those that professed to be Christians, were brought in the presence of Almighty God. So let us remember that God, as in 9-11, is still on the throne. Our scripture today comes from 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Verses 13 to 18. We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, concerning those who are asleep, so that you will not grieve like the rest who have no hope. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, in the same way God will bring him with those who have fallen asleep through Jesus. For we say this to you, and by revelation from the Lord, we who are still alive at the Lord's coming will certainly have no advantage over those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the archangel's voice and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, and this is why the therefore is therefore, therefore encourage one another with these words. Let us pray. We remember, God of history and remembrance, we remember. We remember when the towers fell and the lives were lost. We remember the dust and the smoke, the despair and the grief. We remember that sense of vulnerability and shock. We remember the numbness that overwhelmed us as we watched our television screens for hours and hours, waiting for an explanation and understanding that never came. We remember. We remember God of hope and presence, we remember. We remember the heroes, those who rushed to help, who guided the wounded down innumerable flights of stairs, who rose to overwhelm those who held death in their hands. We remember the hours and the days of binding wounds and healing hurts, giving comfort and drying tears. We remember words of support and compassion from nations far and wide, we remember. We remember in part because we see the ripples of that tragic day continue to impact our world 20 years later. We grieve with allies today as our allies grieve with us 20 years ago, and together we wonder if there will ever be an end to violence, to war, to hatred, 
to death. We remember and we grieve our world's inability to learn the things that lead to peace. We call to you now in our remembrance, God of justice and of peace. Give us a will to truly pray that your kingdom may come on earth as it is in heaven. On this day of solemn remembrance, may we honor the lives that were lost in this tragic act. May we give thanks for those who served and saved, rendered aid and assistance. May we give comfort to those whose lives were lost. May we seek justice and peace where it is within our ability and rely on you when the ability escapes us. On this day of solemn remembrance, may we build what has been torn down. May we mend what has been broken. May we live your love when hate seems to reign. May we bear witness to the cause of peace. In your son's name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing together now a song we will remember. This song um, you may not be overly familiar with, but I'm sure you'll pick it up quite quickly. Um, it's a song that we've done during an Easter cantata, um, but it is a very simple tune, but a very powerful message. So if you will, you're welcome to sit for the first, we'll sing the first chorus, then I'll have everybody stand here in just a second, and we'll all sing together.
sing together another song because in all things that have happened not only in 20 years ago but all since then and all throughout eternity there's only one who we can put our total tra trust and faith in and that's in Christ alone let's sing together in Christ alone Father, Lord, we do give you thanks. Lord, we are so blessed beyond measure. Lord, truly it is in you and through you that all things are possible. But we know that during all of these times, Lord, when we struggle, when we go through heartaches and pains, you are with us. You are holding us and you are guiding us and you are comforting us. Lord, we just can't thank you enough for that. Lord, again, we just thank you so much for all that you do. Lord, we ask you to be with Pastor Scott now as he brings a message. Just lift him up through this, through this time and speak through him in mighty ways. Lord, we give you all the thanks and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. How's everybody doing today? 
Uh, oh, y'all are asleep. How is everybody doing today? Amen. All right, that's better. That's better. You know, as we uh, take time to remember uh, 9-11, the events that happened 20 years ago, uh, I'm just going to go ahead and warn you. Some of y'all are going to cry today, okay? So just, just go ahead, pull out your tissue, just, just get them ready. Uh, um, it's hard, you know, to think back and not be moved in your spirit. So I'm just going to warn you, preparing you for that. Uh, but we're going to have we're going to have a good time as we study God's word, as we turn to Him for strength and for comfort. And today we're going to be in the book of Joshua. We'll be in the first part of Joshua, and Joshua is a great place uh, for us to go and to remember the events of 9/11. And remembering is important. Uh, remembering helps us heal. Uh, remembering is a method when, where we can grow intellectually, that we learn from our past. Remembering uh, is also a, a spiritual practice. God many times throughout the Bible calls his people to remember. God commanded through Moses to remember the Sabbath. Why did God want Moses to command the Israelites or to remember the Sabbath? Why did he want that? Because he wanted them to, to know that you are more than work. You are more than busyness. You are more than the stuff that you collect. God wanted his people to remember the Sabbath, to know him. God wanted his people to celebrate the Sabbath so we could have community, so that we could be together. God wanted you to enjoy the Sabbath so that you would enjoy this creation and this universe that he has given to us. God also commanded the Israelites to remember the Passover celebrating the day that God freed them from 400 years of slavery. In the New Testament, Jesus Christ, he, he, re, he commands us to remember his death and resurrection. While he was having dinner with his disciples, Jesus broke the bread and he passed and he said, do this in remembrance of me. And on that same night, in the same way, after he passed the wine, Jesus said, take and drink in remembrance of me. Why do we need to remember Christ's death and resurrection? Because no matter how bad things get here, we who trust in Christ have paradise waiting for us. Amen? We can take comfort. We can have hope in that. We also need to, re we also need to remember the cross because when we begin to wonder about our own suffering, we see that Christ suffered. And that we have a God who can relate to us. He understands our pain. He understands our suffering. He understands the trials that we go through. And we are not called to lose hope in suffering. Actually, quite the opposite. We have hope in suffering because of the work of the Holy Spirit in us, because of how the Holy Spirit empowers us, how the Holy Spirit comforts us and how the Holy Spirit reminds us of truth. And the truth is that Jesus Christ really is the Son of God and that Jesus Christ really did go to the cross for our sins and died in our place. And he really did rise up on the third day, proving he is the Son of God and proving that he has the power over life and death. And Paul writes to us to remember this truth. He wrote in 1 Corinthians 15, don't turn there, I'm going to read this for you, stay in Joshua. And this is what Paul wrote, for I pass on to you as most important what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and then he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to, the other, to over 500 brothers and sisters at one time, most of them who are still alive, as Paul wrote this, but some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, and then to all of the apostles, and last of all, as to one born born, uh, appeared to me, born at the wrong time, he also appeared to me. The Holy Spirit speaks this truth to our soul, that Christ lived and died and was raised from the grave. We are commanded to remember this truth. And as we study Joshua, as we move from chapter one and chapter three into a couple more chapters, we're going to fly through all of it. We are called to remember we are commanded many times to remember. And before there is a call to remember, there is a call to be faithful. Before there's ever a call to remember, there is a call 
to be faithful. Joshua 1, 6 says, be strong and courageous. Why is Joshua commanded to be strong and courageous? Courageous, Because Moses has passed. One of the greatest leaders Israel has ever known has passed away. How would, you be, how would you like to be the guy that has to replace Moses? That's nerve-wracking, right? You don't want to replace that guy because everybody remembers, everybody knows what he has done. And you know the second that you fall short, the moment that you don't do something like Moses did, what's going to happen? People are going to start complaining. Yeah, they're going to start start uh, uh, just going on and on. I'm like, hey, that's not how Moses did it. And the complainers are going to complain. And we know the Israelites had a lot of complainers, right? It cost them 40 years of, of additional wandering in the desert. We should be very careful about what we complain about. Now, as Joshua replaces Moses, he must wonder himself, will God speak to me directly like he spoke to Moses? Joshua must wonder, uh, 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 you know, remember when Moses struck a rock with his staff and fresh water gushed out and, and it was provided fresh water for all the Israelites. Will God provide for me if the Israelites get in the same way? Or what about when Moses lifted up his hands towards heaven and the Israelites who were in battle and as Moses raised his hands, he gave the Israelites victory in battle. Would God be with Joshua? Would, would God give them the victory through Joshua like he gave Moses and the Israelites victory? Moses, who held out his staff and his hands and the, and the Red Sea parted, would God do the same for Joshua? And now that Moses is gone, the promised land stands before them. The wandering in the desert is over, but there's all sorts of new challenges, new enemies, new things that are going to come before the Israelites. You know, the call for courage never comes when life is easy. The call for courage always comes at our hardest and sometimes even the most darkest and evil moments. The call for courage is a call for faithfulness. And the call for courage never comes at convenient times. On September 11, 2001, at 9.34 a.m., Tom Burnett called his wife to tell her, our plane has been hijacked by four terrorists. The terrorists said there is a bomb on board, they have pushed us to the back of the plane, and that they are returning the plane to the airport. Three minutes into that conversation, the Pentagon is hit. His wife informs Tom, of the other hijacked planes and the targets that have been hit. At 9.45 a.m., Tom tells his wife, we have to do something. I'm putting together a plan. Other passengers, including Mark Bingham, Jeremy Glick, and Todd Beamer, join the plan. Tom Burnett, he worked in sales and marketing as a VP in a medical device company. He was a husband and father of three girls. Mark Bingham, uh, he played rugby, and he was on that plane returning to a fraternity brother's wedding. Todd Beamer, he was a husband traveling for work. He taught Sunday school, volunteered in the youth group, and played on the church softball team. Jeremy Glick, he was born in a Jewish family and had five siblings. He was married, and his last words to his wife, We're going to rush the hijackers. At 9.57, six minutes before United Airlines Flight 93 crashes into southern Pennsylvania, the cockpit recorder picks up sounds of fighting, the aircraft losing control at 30,000 feet, and the crash of the trolley, dishes being hurled, smash, terrorists screaming, hold the door, But what else is recorded? What else is recorded? Let's get them and give it to me. Give it to me was one of the last recorded sentences before the plane crashed, indicating a fight for the controls of the plane. 
The call for courage does not come at convenient times. The call for courage comes whether you're prepared or not. Tom, Mark, Jeremy, Todd, mostly businessmen, not anti-terrorists, decided that they were going to do something. The call for courage comes when we least expect it. And sadly, the call for courage does not promise victory here in this life. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they knew this. They stood before King Nebuchadnezzar, the most powerful king in the world at that time. He said, look, either you worship me or I'm going to throw you into the fire. Their response, God will save us. God will save us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow to you, king. We're not going to do it. Courage does not promise the victory here on this side of eternity. But courage is faithfulness. Courage is doing what is right and leaving the results in God's hands. How do you do what is right? How do you have courage in moments like this? How do you trust the results in God's hands? How do we do that? Well, let's go back to our verse, Joshua 1.6. It says, be strong and courageous, for you will distribute the land I swore to their ancestors to give them as an inheritance. Courage is an act of faith. Faith is trusting in God's word, trusting in his promises. Faith is not blind. Jesus' death and resurrection are real historical events that took place. The Bible is the best documented historical document there has ever been. We have 5,800 ancient Greek manuscripts, 10,000 Latin manuscripts, 9,300 ancient manuscripts, and that number continues to grow as they go from cave to cave, finding more and more Dead Sea Scrolls. It is the best documented, ancient document. Nothing else comes close to the reliability of the Bible. Faith is not feelings. The prophet Jeremiah wrote in 17.9, he says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Our feelings trick us. Our feelings deceive us. Our feelings can leave us in the wrong way. That is why Solomon wrote two chapters back to back about avoiding adultery, Proverbs 6 and 7. Our feelings can lead us astray. Our faith is not blind. Our faith is not feelings. Faith is trusting in the promises of God through his word. It's trusting that God will do what he said he would do. And so we can have faith in this. We can have faith that God will never leave us nor forsake us. Deuteronomy 31.6, because God said it. God promised it. We can have faith that God will wipe away all our sins. Isaiah 43.25, that is promised. We can believe and trust that God will wipe away all of our sins. We can believe that when we are tempted, God will provide a way out. God will provide a way that we won't have to give in to sin. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that is a promise of God. God also promises Christ will return, John 14, 3. These are promises that we can believe in because they are promises from God spoken from his word. And so Joshua can be courageous in leading the Israelites into the promised land because God already commanded them to go. God already said, I'm going to give you the land. Joshua didn't need to consult, consult the elders of the church. God didn't, or Joshua didn't need to take a church, church vote. They didn't need to see if they had money in the budget. They can go because God said go. God set a path for them, showed, showed them the land. God promised them. You can be courageous when you are trusting in the promises of God's word. That's what Joshua 1.6 shows us. Joshua 1, 6 and 7, be strong and courageous for you will distribute the land I swore to their ancestors to give to them as an inheritance. Above all, be strong and very courageous. Here's a second command. Be strong, be very courageous. Why does Joshua need a second command to be strong and courageous? We know Joshua's history. He was there with Caleb when they spied out the land. They said we could take it. Joshua is there on the battlefield against the Amalekites as Moses lifted up their hands and gave them victory. But when his hands came down, 
they would not be as successful. Joshua was down on that battlefield. Hasn't Joshua proved himself to be strong and courageous? Why does Joshua need a second command to be strong and to be courageous? Because it's in our nature to doubt. It's in our nature to second guess ourselves. There's evidence of this uh, of this nature to doubt and second guess ourselves. Every time we play this game, you know, you ask yourself this question or someone's asked you this question before. Hey, if you could go back and change things, would you? You know, that's all about second, second guessing our past. That's not, not second guessing one decision. That's second guessing everything, right? There's more evidence of this on, on Monday morning. Well, hey, what happens Every coaching decision and every quarterback throw is re-examined by the Monday morning quarterbacks, right? We second guess them. Was that really the best thing for them to do? Or even when we just turn on the six o'clock news, we re-examine and we scrutinize every political decision made. It's in our nature to second guess. It's in our nature to doubt. But instead of asking, but instead of second guessing, we should just be asking ourselves and doing, are we doing it God's way? Are we doing what God has told us to do? Here's what the rest of the verse says. It says, be strong, be very courageous. Here's the rest of it. To observe carefully the whole instruction, not the parts that are easy, not the parts that make sense, not the parts that just the culture approves of, but the whole instruction. We are to observe carefully the whole instruction that my servant Moses commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left so that you will have success wherever you go. Very clearly, God says, stay on the path. Don't veer just a little bit to the left. Don't veer a little bit just to the right. Follow my whole instruction. Then you will have success. Then you will be successful wherever you go when we stay on the straight and narrow of God's word. Verse 8, this book of instruction must not depart from your mouth. You are to meditate on it day and night so that you may carefully observe everything written in it. Everything we do in church, the word of God should be present. God guarantees when we follow his word, when we do it carefully, when we do it his way, we'll be successful in everything we do. God's word should be present in all that we do. The word of God guides us. <clears throat> Excuse me. The word of God sets us apart. The word of God reveals Jesus Christ to us and gives us our ultimate hope. And we will be successful and we will prosper in whatever we do. If we want our church to flourish, if we want to be successful in what we do, we must focus on the Word of God. And to focus on the Word of God, we have to be reading it, not just here Sunday morning at church, but in our lives, in our daily walks. We need to read and focus on God's Word. We need to think about it. We need to talk about it, not just here, but in our homes, in our workplaces, in our communities, in our hobbies, take God's word with you. Because the word of God will give you courage. The word of God will equip you to do what is right when things are tough. It'll remind us that we can leave the results in God's hands. Verse 9, haven't I commanded you be strong and courageous? All right, in case you haven't gotten it yet, here's a third time. Be strong, be courageous. Why do we need a third reminder? It goes on, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. The Lord God is with you wherever you go. God is with us wherever we go, amen? God is with us wherever we go. We can trust in that promise. And God is about to demonstrate not only his presence with Joshua, but his power before a new generation of the Israelites. All right? He's sending them against Jericho. By the way, this is a really just important apologetic note. 
The Bible mentions over 2,000 cities throughout all of Scripture. Why does the Bible mention over 2,000 cities throughout all of Scripture? Because God wants to know where, where God wants us to know where He's been and how He's worked and how He's proven Himself and how He's worked in these people, this people, that people. We can look at the Bible and see all the places, all the miracles, all the things that God has done, and no other religious literature is like that. No other religious literature even comes close to naming the number of cities and the geography and all that God is doing throughout this land. So God sends them against Jericho. Jericho is not strategically the first city they should take. The first city they should take is either Ai or Bethel. Uh, my Old Testament professor, Dr. Warren, he's actually been to the city of Ai, uh, in the area of Jericho, been to Bethel, and he's actually excavated in this area. Uh, he's got to search, got to do work in there. And the city of Ai is 3,000 feet up from Jericho. By going after Jericho first, they're at a military disadvantage. Because you see, God is calling these people to march around the city for seven days and seventh time on the seventh day. And every time they're marching around the city, they're at a lower elevation than two cities that God is about to call them to take next. They are at a complete military disadvantage if Ai or Bethel in this moment comes and decides to attack Israel. Israel is out in the open with no shelter, no place to hide. God has set Israel up in a defenseless position. Why would God set Israel up in a defenseless position? Because it's not them who's taking Jericho. It's God who is giving Jericho to them. They don't take Jericho by their military might. They take Jericho by turning and screaming at the walls and the city comes tumbling down. That's not by their power. That's by God. And so God is about to demonstrate his presence and his power to a new generation. You know, Moses also had a moment like this when the whole nation of Israel was defenseless. Children and senior adults out in the open, backed up against the Red Sea. What did the Israelites say? Oh, we're all going to die. We're all going to die. And what did God tell Moses? Stretch out your staff, stretch out your hands. And as he did that, the waters parted. There was a wall of water and the Israelites crossed over on dry ground. Now you fast forward 40 years. Joshua and the Israelites are coming to the Jordan. They come to the Jordan not during the dry season, but during the rainy season. The scripture says the river was overflowing. Can you imagine Joshua and the Israelites walking up to this river that's overflowing that they're supposed to cross? You hear the person in the background, right? Whose bright idea was this? <laughs> we, you know, you're right. They were thinking it. And Joshua says, we're going to step into the river. And that same person back there grumbling, no, 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 you're supposed to hold your staff up first and, and hold your hand up and we'll see walls of water. And there'll be dry ground for us to pass, pass through. That's not what God told Joshua. God told Joshua to step in the water first. Some of us are stuck in fear because we're afraid to get our feet wet. But that's exactly what God was commanding Joshua and the nation of Israel to do. Step in the water first and then I'll part the waters. And you know what? They stepped in the waters. And when they stepped in the water, somebody said, it's not working. You know why they said it's not working? Because when Moses, Moses held up his hand in the staff, there was a wall of water on both sides, and they could pass through on dry ground. What does the scripture say when, when Joshua and the priests stepped into the river? What happened? There wasn't a wall. No, it backed up to the next city. It spread out dry ground from as far as that city to that city, and the whole nation could walk across as one if they wanted to. God was doing a new miracle in a new way and showing people and telling people, hey, you got to have a new faith. God was teaching them. God was instructing them. God was teaching them how to have a new 
faith. To learn to, to, to move forward and not trust in, in old things, but to believe the, the promise and to have faith. If you want to see God move, sometimes we have to get our feet wet. We have to be willing to show our faith first. Uh, on vacation, I got to hang out with one of my buddies, and, and, and he's a pastor too. And um, he says, you know, many times I have church members who come to me, and they'll ask, hey, hey, why don't we have new people come to our church? And he kindly asks them, well, who have you invited? He doesn't get many answers. He says, you know, I hear many people in my church that say, we, wanna, we want a revival in our church. He says, that's great, I do too. How are we praying to make that happen? And, and he says, he gets blank stares back. He says, I have a, a, a Sunday school teacher, and um, um, they want to know why new people aren't coming to my class. Well, I can tell you why new people don't come to a Sunday school class. When I was in college, uh, me and three of my friends, we, we enjoyed Sunday morning trying out different churches, and we wouldn't just visit during worship. We'd, vi- we'd visit during Sunday school. And, and I recall visiting a Sunday school class. And as we came in, there were no extra seats. And, and, and all the space at the table was taken. And so as we came in, they, they kind of scrambled and they found some seats. But they gave us seats that, that weren't even at the table. We sat against the wall. We sat on the outside of the group that was already there. You know, if you want people to come to your Sunday school class, you've got to have an open seat for guests. You have to show God that you're ready and expecting new people to come. You can't can't just respond. You have to prepare. You have to be willing to step forward first. You know, that church that that me and my friends went to, we we never went back. We never felt welcomed. So you have to do things to to show God that you're, you're ready you got to have that open chair. You know where the best place to have that, that new guest chair for your Sunday school is? It's by the door. So they don't have to walk by everybody and feel awkward by climbing over. You have those open chairs reserved for guests by the door. You also just have to be on time. You ever show up somewhere before anyone else arrived? Especially when you're the guest, you're like, hey, what's going on? Is this place open today? you got to be on time. Sometimes it means, you know, you're buying two dozen of donuts instead of one dozen donuts. You know, God will provide a miracle. God will provide a miracle through what he has promised us. But sometimes we have to step in the water first. You see, the problem is we want our miracle. We want, we want God to do it, and then we say we'll go. But no, God is telling Joshua and the Israelites, you got to step first. I'll give you the miracle once you step forward. Look, God is completely sovereign in all things, but in love and wisdom and purpose, God invites us. And he says, you first. He says, you first. God, just, God said to Elijah, hey, I will send the fire, but you have to build the altar first. God said to Noah, I'll send the rain, but you've got to build an ark first. God said to Elisha, I'll send some more rain and I fill up the cisterns in the ditch, but there are no ditches. You got to go dig them first. You want a miracle where well, you have to step forward in faith first. Joshua, you want me to part the waters? Well, you got to step into the river first. God says, you first. Will God be with Joshua like he was with Moses? No, he is going to be with Joshua in new and exciting ways. Ways in which Joshua and the people will have to demonstrate their own faith in God. When a new generation of Israelites will have to show their faith in God. God is calling us to show that we have faith and that we will trust in him in new ways, in new circumstances, in new places all over this world. As the Israelites pass through the river, as the water is backed up from city to city, they're commanded to pick up 
stones. Not a little stone like this stone or little ones like that, but they were, they were big, heavy stones because they were going to build an altar. They were being called to remember what God was doing in that moment, that God is with their new leader, that God is with a new generation. Remembering is a spiritual discipline. Remembering is healthy. Remembering is good for us because it reminds us of the good things that God has done in our life. We've had a hard time remembering lately. Uh, We've had a hard time remembering because we've been really focused on the problems in our world from politics to COVID to crisis all over. We've had a hard time remembering. And I think we just need to take time to remember. I was, I was at Joe Pierce's funeral, at the reception at his funeral. And I, and I, was, I was thanking a guest for, for coming. I said, thank you so much for, for supporting Neva and supporting the rest of the family. And, and as I'm talking to him, I say, you know, it's been a really hard time for, for people to grieve and for people to mourn. And I'm, I'm really concerned about people in my church who have who have lost folks. I think we just go through the grieving process way too fast and we don't spend uh, enough time on it and really give the people help that they need. And, you know, grief is not something that that, that you go to bed and you wake up and it's gone. And as I say these things to this gentleman, a tear runs down his face. I had no idea, but he had lost his his wife five years earlier on that day. And his wife, not his wife, but his daughter just wraps her arm around her dad and informs me of that. Grief is not something that just disappears. We're called to remember and to remember the blessings and remember the goodness that they've brought in our life. Sometimes the call for courage comes in the middle of grief. It comes at the most unexpected times. You know, I just wonder as the Israelites were passing through the Jordan, that emotions just didn't swell up in Joshua. So they just didn't start to overflow. I bet Joshua just said, I wish Moses could see this moment right now. I wish Moses could see the water backed up from city to city. You know, Joshua didn't have much time to, to grieve. Uh, uh, they, they had just buried Moses 30 days prior to these events. 30 days, the greatest leader of the Israelites has, has passed. And now, and now they're at the Jordan. Now they're about to go against Jericho. The call, is, the call of courage just comes to us sometimes in the middle of our grief. And, you know, during the, the, the pandemic, and, and I'm counting the pandemic all the way to about April of 2020 when things first uh, shut down. The Lord has called 16 members of our church family home. That's, that's just our church family. That's not talking about our extended families. 16 of our members in the last year, year and a half, have been called home to the Lord. Joe Pierce, who I've mentioned, and Joe, who overcame many obstacles in his life and became very successful at everything he did in business and life and family. Sandy Patrick, who longed to be here, who wanted our prayers. Alma Moore, who had the best view from her house and enjoyed long conversations. That view and those long conversations were really therapeutic for my soul. Faye Furman with his wit and love for God's word. Adele and her adventurous spirit. Frances Green, the last time I was with her, she beat me at dominoes. I'm not happy about that. Nancy Sayer, I I never got to meet her, but she's part of the McMasters family. And so if you know Jen and the rest of the McMasters, reach out to them. Faye Turner, we all know how much fun she can be. When I'd visit her at home, she's like, look, you know, no matter what was going wrong, she'd be like, look, I can still do this. And she'd pick up her foot above her head. I can't even get it above my waist, you know. And Nancy Freeman, who knew everything about this church and this community. Pearl Tigner, who loved her boys. 
Alice Sells, who could bake anything. And on my visits to Alice, she always wanted to know about everybody else. Mary Riggins, who taught us so much about Lottie Moon. Rachel Carmines, it was always fun to, to, to visit her because as we went, I always took Floyd with me and she picked on Floyd the whole time. And I can't pick on Floyd right now. He's coming home from the hospital today, but, but we had a good time together. Reynolds Wright, man, she could hug like no one else. You thought you were going to pop every time she squeezed you. Nikki Massey, who no matter how bad he was feeling, and guys, he was feeling bad. He was hurting. But he always told us, blessed by the best. Those are our uh, Jimmy Morris. I didn't get to know him, but I've gotten to know his incredible family and his legacy through you guys. These 16 of our church members, that's not talking about, about our families that have lost outside family members. The Knowles, the Farmers, Roxanne Overby, Sue Nimi are just a few of the families that have lost loved ones during this pandemic. And, you know, the hardest thing about, about grieving during the pandemic is we're separated. You know, in Jewish culture, you weren't called to be separated from others when you were grieving. They actually just called the community in and people would sit with you all day. And if you wanted to talk, you could talk. And if you wanted to mourn, you could mourn. And if you wanted to eat, they were there to eat with you. And, and, and the, the funeral, the grieving process lasted all week long. And some of us haven't even had about a week of grieving over these last 16 months of this pandemic. How do we have courage in these moments? Well, we sang about it. You remember the cross, a real historical event where the Son of God died in our place, was buried in a grave, but did not stay dead. He rose from the grave on the third day. And when he rose from the grave from the third day, he proved he really is God. And he proved that he can really raise us up with him too. I'm going to ask David and the rest of the praise team to come up right now. They're going to sing a song for us. I'm sorry, it's going to make you cry. But sometimes that's good for the soul. It's good for healing. This is a new song, so they're going to remain seated, and we're, we're going to sing to them. Is that right, David? Yeah. And, and so David's going to sing this song, and then I'm going to just come up and close with a few words, and then I'm going to close this out in prayer after that. So I'm going to pass to the praise team right now. We're going to sing a song. It's called Scars in Heaven. And in the chorus that says, the only scars in heaven, they won't belong to me and you. There'll be no such thing as broken and all the old will be made new. And the thought that makes me smile, even as the tears fall down, is that the only scars in heaven are on the hands that hold you now. If I had only known the last time would be the last time I would have took off all the things I had to do I would have stayed a little longer Held on a little tighter Now what I'd give for one more day with you There's a wound here in my heart where something's missing And they tell me that it's gonna heal the time But I know you're in a place where all your wounds have been erased And knowing yours are here is healing mine The only scar
Thank you, praise team. The call to be courageous never comes at convenient times. The call to be courageous comes very difficult times. In our grief and in disaster, we are called to be courageous. Being courageous is an act of faithfulness. Faithfulness we can find by reading and studying and knowing God's word and his promises. So I encourage you today to be courageous, and I have a gift for you. And up here at the front, we have these stones, Be Courageous, from Joshua, to remind us. And some of you need to take these stones, and, and you need to place them next to somebody's picture to remind you to be courageous. Some of you need to take these stones and write a name on here, somebody who's walked away from the faith or never had faith. Some of you need to take these stones and put them on your desk at work. Some of you just need to take these stones and carry them wherever you go. It's a reminder to be courageous. Be courageous through God's word. God's word does not promise us victory here on earth. But being courageous, we can trust that God is in control, and that all things work for the good of those who love him. Be courageous. I'm going to pray for you. 
And um, after I pray for you, if you need prayer, if you've not given your life to Christ and you'd like to speak to me, I'm going to move right outside because these stones are for you and I don't want to bottleneck anything up here. So I'll be right outside after I pray and I'd love to speak with you if you need someone to talk with or someone to pray with. Let us pray together. Father God, help us to be courageous. Help us to move uh, forward in our grief and our hurting and the things that we miss. Help us to be be uh, courageous in proclaiming your name. Help us to be uh, courageous in, in choosing to do what is right. Help us to be courageous in, in, in parenting. Help us to be courageous in our workplaces. Help us to be courageous by remembering what your son did for us on the cross. God, we know that the victory here on earth is not promised. But we pray that you take whatever is about to happen. We pray that we can put our faith and trust in you. And we pray that whatever happens is for your glory and your good. God, I thank you for this congregation. Give them strength, give them fellowship, give them the power to move forward in trusting you. I pray these things in your son's name. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. As, uh, like I said, I have these gifts for you. There's plenty for everyone. And uh, this is for you to help you, to remind you to be courageous. And uh, like I said, I'll be right outside if you would need prayer or would like to talk. Thank you for joining us today. God bless.